Welcome to our 2021 Global Social Justice Research Symposium. I'm Ryan Craig, and I serve as Director of Student Programs at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. Hello, everyone, and I'm Andrea Whistler, and I serve as Executive Director of the Center for Social Justice Research, Teaching, and Service here at Georgetown University. We are delighted to be here, even in very small numbers, in person and on Zoom, to share the work of two signature fellowship programs, the Education and Social Justice Project and the David F. Andretta Summer Research Fellowship. Not only are we featuring two programs, but thanks to pandemic delays, we are celebrating our 2020 and 2021 cohorts of ESJ and Andretta Fellows. The Education and Social Justice Project, ESJ, now in its 12th year, is a collaborative partnership between the Center for Social Justice Teaching and Service, Research Teaching and Service, and the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs. ESJ sends students to conduct field-based research on local global initiatives at the intersection of education and social justice. Although our ESJ fellows conduct research for a few weeks over the summer, the fellowship is a full year. We provide robust support in mentored research, including an introductory research methods course and digital scholarship training for fellows to produce their vertical case studies. All of our past projects are available on the Berkeley Center's website. In 2021, ESJ awarded summer fellowships to four students who spent three weeks with institutions engaged in efforts to promote social justice through education across the United States and virtually in Palestine. Our 2020 ESJ fellows pivoted to virtual research projects, focusing on the response of Jesuit institutions to the global pandemic in Nepal, Peru, and the United States. Through the David F. Andretta MD Explorer Fund, a rising senior is awarded $5,000 to conduct research on a social justice issue somewhere in the world. David Andretta, a graduate of the class of 1999 of the college and the Georgetown Medical School class of 2004 was an adventurous soul and a true son of Georgetown. Throughout his 31 years of life, David enthusiastically explored the world. He was a loving son, husband, brother, mentor, and friend, and known for his hard work, his, his zest for life, and his legacy will be, and as you will learn today, has been embraced and extended by each successive fellowship recipient. We are showcasing our fellows research, but it is the work of our community partners that we seek to lift up today. And we'd like to thank them for hosting our fellows, especially under unusual circumstances. Lauren DeVoe at La Ruiz, Marcial Hernandez with the Majas Center, Father Jiju Varghese, and Dia at St. Xavier's College, Tara DeWarsop and Father Zach Rossetti with Thrive for Life, Julia Kramer at the Sacred Heart Center, Kevin Sullivan at Nativity Prep, Brother Peter Alarno, Lena Kamis, and Kam Jamil Kadir at Bethlehem University, our Andretta partners at Onofanta, Oneonta, Oneonta Park and Rec, and the Rocky Mountain Land Library, as well as countless staff and volunteers at these incredible institutions who provided contacts, fielded questions from me and our fellows, sometimes housed and fed our fellows um, due to the pandemic, but always made themselves available for Zoom calls. We are incredibly grateful for your work and your support. Before we introduce our first panel, we'd like to offer a special thanks to the SETS crew for setting up the technology today, our colleagues at the Berkeley Center for providing event support, Amy Vanderbilt, Ruth Gopin, and Shimung Tong, and more. <laughs> Thank you also so much to every supporter and donor to these programs. Deep gratitude to the friends and family of David Andretta, who are joining us via Zoom and in person today, and for their trust in the Center for Social Justice and our Hoyas to honor David through this fellowship. So each panel, we have three, will share their research for 30 minutes with questions reserved at the end. To our audience members on Zoom, please put your questions in the chat and they will be relayed to our student researchers at that time. So, on to our first panel.
Bailey Steinhauser is a transfer student who graduated from the College in Justice and Peace Studies in May 2021. Bailey pivoted her original research proposal in Rwanda to a place-based project in response to the COVID pandemic in her New York hometown. Bailey is now in law school at the University of Indiana at Bloomington. She's in class at the moment, so we will watch a video of her presentation. Kat Woodard, a senior in the School of Foreign Service, conducted research this summer virtually with Bethlehem University in the West Bank as an ESJ 2021 fellow. And Tiara Hatfield, who is pursuing a master's in conflict resolution, conducted field work at St. Xavier's College in Nepal. This project was started by class of 2021 student Rohil Kirkani and supported by class of 2024 student Anthony Bonavita. We'll start with Bailey's video presentation. Hi, my name is Bailey Steinhauer, and I was the recipient of the 2020 Andretta Fellowship. As you may imagine, this is not the project that I had initially set out to do. But nonetheless, the fellowship provided me with a great opportunity to reconnect with my community and learn more about how our youth have been impacted by COVID. I wish I could be back on the hilltop with you all in person, but I am nonetheless thrilled to share with you my experience. My project was a single case qualitative research study using semi-structured interviews. I interviewed counselors and conducted focus groups with campers at my local summer rec, a day camp program in my hometown of Geneseo, New York. The aim of the project was to understand how a year of social distancing in school has impacted youth. Summer camp experiences have been documented to facilitate youth growth in social skills such as leadership, friendship skills, social comfort, and peer relationships. With the pandemic eliminating most opportunities for growth, as the first major gathering of youth after a year of social distancing, summer camps demonstrated the extent to which youth have been affected socially by the pandemic. For the youth in the Geneseo community, there had been a slow transition to more in-person classes, but Summer Rec returning was the first event that really operated in the same manner that it would have pre-COVID. This made it the perfect place to study youth interactions post-COVID. There are three main takeaways from my project that I would like to share with you all today. First is the resilience of kids. Overwhelmingly, the sentiment relayed to me in my interviews is that these kids are really strong and they have coped well with the pandemic, such that they were able to return to a normal social life with little hiccup. Next was the role that removing masks played in that feeling of normal being regained. And finally was how imperfect this project was. Knowing what I learned and how the pandemic evolved, I would have approached it very differently. So first, I would like to focus on the resilience of kids. This was a really exciting outcome from my research. At first, it seemed like I wasn't getting any data, and then I realized not having any concrete ways in which the kids were falling behind is data. I know that we have been hearing about studies done um, that talk about how much instructional time kids have lost in school and how far behind the average kid is in a matter of months as a result of the pandemic. You think those studies are contributing to this feeling of doom and gloom we have about the pandemic, and I was expecting this one to turn out that way too. But the counselors said they themselves had a more awkward return to social life than the kids did. The only thing they mentioned as a concrete difference between this year and previous years was that kids seemed to seek more hugs. I even saw this reflected in the limited interaction that I had with the kids. As soon as we got over the initial awkwardness of me having a recorder and asking them questions. The kids opened up and were very excited to tell me about Summer Rec. It didn't feel like these kids were at any sort of a social loss. Another interesting takeaway was the role of masks. Kids and counselors alike were quick to emphasize the relief of not wearing masks at camp and how that was one of the biggest factors in making things really feel normal. Kids also spoke about the role masks played in diminished social capacity at school and how they were a barrier to making new friends in school and maintaining conversations. 
This finding feels especially significant considering the way we are continuing to use masks and the phase of the pan pandemic that we have entered into which the kids are the most vulnerable. With schools returning and masks still being widely used, if not mandated, I think things will still feel very different for the kids. Even if they are back all five full days a week, it was made very clear to me that the ultimate sign of normalcy is going to be losing the masks. There are two manners in which this project is flawed. First of all, when I designed the project, we thought we were at the tail end of the pandemic and I would be able to ask these questions with a retrospective lens. When we had the Delta variant hit the United States hard, we entered into a new phase where these same youth are now the most vulnerable. I don't know how much this project will actually reflect the attitude of kids post pandemic because we haven't really emerged from it the way that we thought we would have when this project got started. Especially because this new wave is likely to be the most traumatic to the youth, all this research may reflect is how kids felt that one summer, rather than how kids feel post-pandemic. Secondly, I really expected there to have been some loss in social development, so I framed my questions in a much more negative sense. I think there was probably stuff the kids gained if we were willing to extend what social development means. I bet these kids have a much stronger virtual communication literacy. But I wasn't asking what they got out of it. I was asking what they lost. And I was really only looking at in-person interaction. Um, I think asking new questions once we have gotten to the other side of the pandemic will be an even more fruitful research project. With all that being said, it was still a great experience. Seeing these kids jump back into social life with little reservations was inspirational, and I got the sense that the counselors felt the same way. This research is helpful for the teachers and parents in Geneseo and elsewhere to know that going forward, um, though months of lost instructional time may seem like a terrifying number, these kids aren't falling behind in every regard. This is one area in which we do not need to continue to stress about how our kids have been impacted. Your kids can still make friends. Your kids can still go outside and play with their friends. And they probably jumped back into their social lives with more ease than you did. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Kat Woodard and this summer I had the pleasure of serving as an education and social justice research fellow at Bethlehem University, which is located in West Bank, Palestine. When I first found out I was going to Bethlehem, I could not have been more excited given my own context as an international culture and politics major with a specific focus in interreligious dialogue. I'm also an Arabic minor and a religion, ethics, and world affairs minor through the Berkeley Center, so this could not have been a better fit for me. Um, to tell you a little bit more about Bethlehem University, it's located in the occupied Palestinian territory of West Bank, as you can see at the bottom of the map there. Since 2000, there's been about a 40% increase um, in student enrollment thanks to collaboration with the Palestinian Department of Education. So it made it a great time to be there and see how the university is adapting to a new amount of students. It was established by the De La Salle Brotherhood in 1973 in collaboration with the Vatican with the specific aim of establishing a Catholic university within the Holy Land. For a Catholic university, um, Bethlehem actually has some really interesting student demographics. So there are 3,200 current students, 93% uh, of those are undergraduates graduates, 78% are female and 22% are male. Shout out to all the females in higher ed at Bethlehem University. Um, <laughs> with that being said, 77% of the students are actually Muslim and 23% are Christian, which I found particularly interesting that it is a Christian university catering to a predominantly Muslim audience. So I tried to be mindful of that in my research. With that said, Almost half of the students I interviewed were Muslim and about half were Christian, and the same goes for male-female split. I had about half in my research, which provided some really interesting um, perspectives in regard to that. 
Um, additionally, about 90% of the students are either from Bethlehem or Jerusalem, um, and an additional 8% from Hebron, and about 2% from the additional remaining territories in Palestine. This was of particular interest to me and in that many of the administrators that I spoke with expressed that students in other regions hope to attend Bethlehem University, but lack access to doing so because they do not have the appropriate documentation to get to the university, given um, the Israeli occupation of the West Bank. To speak to my specific research, I conducted Zoom interviews with current and former students, faculty and administrators about Bethlehem University's human rights course. Um, here at Georgetown, we are also a Catholic university, but we do not teach a particular human rights course through the lens of Catholic social teaching. So I wanted to explore more as to why this course was one offered at Bethlehem University and two required of undergraduate students to be taken. Uh, so I had three primary research questions guiding me as I went. Uh, first, how has human rights education at Bethlehem impacted your life outside the classroom? So what are the real world applications of the things you're learning? Two, um, can you identify any key takeaways from the curriculum? And three, in what ways um, could the curriculum be improved? Is there any area in which you feel the class is lacking? So with those as my guiding questions, I have two findings that I would like to focus on today. The first of which is the role of language. I found that language is absolutely crucial. This class is taught in English, whereas the majority of Bethlehem University's classes are taught in Arabic. Um, and that was something I was curious in learning more about. When I spoke to administrators, they expressed to me that the English language component was absolutely crucial and that English is the dominant language of human rights theory. And so it was important for their students to be able to explore human rights theory within that specific context. But this was slightly concerning for me. I was afraid that students who lacked a firm grasp on English wouldn't be able to benefit from the class in the same way that students who have a better knowledge of English were. In my findings, I found that this wasn't true at all. Students who lacked um, a firm grasp on English still greatly benefited from the class in that they could read human rights theory within the context of a classroom where they could ask their professors questions, work with other students, and had um, a really large amount of resources that they could pull from in terms of understanding. And so those students communicated to me that the resources Bethlehem was providing them to succeed in this class were absolutely crucial, both in terms of their success in the course as well in applying it to their life afterwards. Um, and then in addition to that, students who had a firm grasp on the English language greatly benefited from the class and that they felt empowered by a new set of vocabulary when interacting with members of the Israeli Defense Force, specifically at IDF checkpoints. Um, many of those students have to go through those to get to school every day, so it really was making an impact on how they lived their life. My next finding is that understanding context is incredibly important, both for the students and for the university. When looking at Palestinian history through the lens of human rights theory, many students realized that the ongoing human rights violations in Palestine were actually worse than they initially perceived. And by that, I mean that many of the students realized the abuses they were experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis fall under the UN definition of human rights violations and understanding that their human rights were caused Modified, gave them additional empowerment and knowing that they could stand their ground and to the, deg the degree to which they could stand their ground in these interactions. So that's been incredibly important as well. I do have an outstanding issue that I would like to bring up. Many students addressed me and said that there is no way for them to communicate the knowledge that they gained within their human rights course. There are two predominant issues that they're facing, the first of which is online censorship. They felt as if they could not communicate what they learned online because they knew people were watching them. And then they were concerned about sharing within their community because they didn't know where their other community members stood politically. So they've gained all this knowledge and now it's a question of how do I apply it? I know it personally, but how can I share this? Because I think it's really important. And I found that 
there was one exception to that, which is the Bethlehem University Ambassadors Program. Um, the Ambassadors Program allows students to um, interact with uh, people coming to the university, much like a tour guide would here at Georgetown University. But in the process, they receive training um, to discuss how the Palestinian occupation has affected their lives. And so they're given more appropriate language um, from the university, but still are allowed to express their opinions. So that was a real shining star within my research. Ultimately, I'm curious to see how the university moves forward with their human rights education, especially given COVID. This is the one time in which they've offered the class in Arabic as well, just to make sure that students were able to engage in ways that is accessible online. So the program is greatly evolving, but I'm walking away with a confident sense that Bethlehem is well equipping their students to engage in human rights. Thank you so much. That's it from me. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my presentation on social justice and education during the COVID-19 um, crisis in Nepal, Kathmandu. My name is Tiara Hatfield. I am a graduate student in the Conflict Resolution and Global Human Development Program, and my background is in humanitarian programming and monitoring evaluation, usually within a crisis uh, response areas. Um, and typically in Africa and the Middle East, but through the CSJ Fellowship and my research in Nepal, I've been exploring a lot of these same issues in the context of Asia. So my site for my research was in Kathmandu, which is located in one of the most urbanized and populous uh, areas of Nepal. The college was St. Saviour's College. Um, the Jesuits began their educational work in Nepal in the 1950s, and prior to that, education was mainly only accessible for the wealthy and the elite. Um, and St. Xavier's was established in 1988. It has about 3,000 students, um, representing all 77 districts of Nepal, which includes almost all of the linguistic and cultural diversity in Nepal. And um, the university is based on its Jesuit values, and as common in a lot of Jesuit institutions, they run a very innovative program called Partnerships in Education. Um, Partnerships in Education was the focus of my research for this fellowship. It was established in 2004 by the Department of Social, uh, of Social Work in, in St. Saviors, and it, the goal of the program is to lift up marginalized youth um, through providing pre-tuition classes, usually from grades one to eight. Um, there are three pillars of the program. The first is education, so providing tuitional support um, on, uh, for example, like exam prep and supplementary education. The second was um, personal development, so encouraging students from these marginalized and usually low income areas to engage in extracurricular, extracurricular activities and sports. And the third was home visits. Um, so students who are volunteering and training in the program would actually go to the PIE youth's homes to learn a bit more about them, them and their backgrounds and needs. So just to give you um, a better understanding of uh, where these settlements are located. The PIE program is mainly serving three informal settlement areas around the campus. So my research question was really focused on what impact COVID-19 crisis had on education and social justice issues, especially um, faced by the PA community. I conducted 15 interviews over Zoom with the PI community, um, including current trainees and volunteers in the program, um, um, as well as past PIE youth who have graduated from the program and parents of current um, PA students. Um, my point of contact for the research was Father Juji, who is a principal at St. Saviors, who has taken on kind of a greater role given um, the COVID pandemic. So just to give you a better idea of the situation of Paul, uh, Nepal has been one of the hardest hit countries in the region. And as you can see from the blue line, they've had two major surges. One was the end of last year and the beginning of this year um, around March was the second surge. 
And this has had huge implications for education as all of the schools have been locked down for almost a year. And furthermore, um, a survey from the World Bank last year indicated that approximately two of every five workers in, in Nepal have reported instances of job losses or prolonged work absence. And this is especially relevant when looking at the fact that 80% of the workforce is in the informal sector, meaning they lack basic social protections or coverage, um, which has had huge impacts for the children of these families. So my key findings that I took away from this research um, are up here. However, um, I'm only going to touch on the issue of connectivity and the digital divide in, the, in this presentation. So, one of the most significant impacts of the COVID pandemic has been the increased significance of computers, internet, and knowledge on information technology. In Nepal, there is a huge digital gap between those of parts of the groups of the society who have access to technology, internet, and data, and those who do not. And this is further increasing um, educational inequality within the city. So what we're seeing Kathmandu is even though um, public schools are able to open and provide online classes and exams, students from settlement areas, those from low income um, households, and those who have primarily lost their sources of incomes are not able to access online modes of schooling. And some of them have even been out of school for the last year and a half. Um, several of the parents with kids in the PIE program um, have, have explained to me their challenges um, with only having one mobile phone in families where they have two to three to four ch kids and children. Therefore, they have to make difficult decisions about which child gets to attend school and which does not. And usually it's the eldest child and predominantly the sons. So um, due to the digital um, barriers to education, students um, from the most marginalized communities and the settlements have become increasingly reliant on community engagement initiatives by private universities and schools, such as PIE for continued education during the lockdown. Um, the PIE has been a huge support for these communities, um, specifically with their outreach to students via phone to check in with them. Um, and support them over the phone with their homework and in-person classes that they were able to host from um, February to April this year, although those were also eventually shut down. So while there's still a lot of uncertainty over the crisis, um, it's clear from the research that um, these private, sec private um, university and school programs are making a huge impact um, and that there's still a lot of opportunity for closer private public partnerships um, for education in Nepal. Um, so those are the main findings that I touched on. Um, however, you can read more about the other findings in the report that we've published in December. Uh, let me see if there are questions. Yes, from the chat, we have a question for Kat. How would you describe the interaction between Muslim and Christian students at Bethlehem University? Um, and then a secondary question, your statistics did not show the presence of any Jewish students. Um, can you explain a little bit about why that would be? Yeah. Just they need to use the, the cam mic. They need to use this. Do they need to use this mic? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Does this work? Can you hear me? Oh, okay, perfect. Uh, yes, to speak to the interaction between Muslim and Christian students, I would say it's highly dependent on the context in which the student was raised. So many of the students that I've been interviewing have come from incredibly insular contexts, and so therefore they had more difficulty navigating student relationships with students of different religions 
Bethlehem definitely tries to encourage it, but it was far more difficult for them than students coming from metropolis areas where they were commonly engaging with students of different faiths. Uh, in addition to this, the religious context of their K through 12 school is also particularly important. Many of the students I interviewed went to a Catholic K through 12 school despite being Muslim as well, so they were already well versed in the language of interreligious dialogue. Um, and then to speak to the secondary question of the Jewish component, that is more in line with the demographics of Palestine itself. There is more um, Muslims and Christians within the country than Jewish people. With that being said, there are still Jewish students. They just make up a very small percentage of who is actually attending Bethlehem University. here have questions. Hi. Um, as both of you were working online primarily through Zoom interviews, what were some of your greatest challenges in navigating this research? Who wants to take that one? <laughs> Um, I think first, of course, we were supposed to be doing this research in person. So I think you um, kind of lack that um, that perspective that you get from being there and meeting with um, with the students and with the community in person and getting to have a better idea of the environment and um, the the schools where where our research was located. Um, I think secondly, for me at least, one of the big issues was time difference. So organizing organizing Zoom calls and meeting um, across, uh, you know, Nepalese time zones and the Eastern time zone here. And um, particularly in my research, a lot of the parents um, of the PIE students that I interviewed with don't have internet or you know, computers or telephones of, of themselves at their homes. And we're needing to come into the school to organize, to do these interviews with me. Um, so yeah, we're very lucky to be able to still conduct this research under COVID. Um, I think for me, the largest thing was contacting the students. <laughs> Actually, it was incredibly difficult in doing that online because most of the students at Bethlehem University are assigned an individual numbered email address, which deactivates as soon as they're no longer a student. So I was trying to work with students who had recently graduated as well, but it was really difficult to get in contact with them because I lacked their individual contact information. It's totally understandable as to why the university does that. It's for security concerns about their students and maintaining anonymity long term, but it made it incredibly difficult to get in touch with those students throughout my research. Any other questions here? Questions? <laughs> okay, my first question is for Kat. So uh, Kat, they have a human rights course based in Catholic social teaching as a requirement at a university with a, that's Catholic with a predominantly Muslim student population. My guess is if I asked most Catholic students at Georgetown, a Catholic university, what is Catholic social teaching, they wouldn't know what to say. So what did it make you think about the curriculum that we have here in the United States that is often required. I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, something that I really learned from my research was that Catholic social teaching is practical. This class was born out of a desire to meet a practical need in teaching students how to navigate um, human rights issues that they're facing every day. And the Catholic social teaching lens taught them how to do that in a way that is both 
peaceful and respectful of their own dignity as an individual person. So it provided a great lens for them to communicate um, their rights and needs through. With that being said, I realized there are lots of ways that we can practically apply Catholic social teaching within our own lives here in the United States that we might be missing the opportunity to do so for. And it certainly shaped how I'm looking at my next semester going forward and thinking about how I want to integrate Catholic social teaching both in terms of my education and what I take here at Georgetown, because we are fortunate to have classes offered in it, whether they're required or not. It is something that I've definitely considered um, partaking in in my future. Okay, Tara, you're not off the hook. I, those, the pictures that you had, I'm sure they must have sent them to you, obviously, because you could not go. Maybe at some point in your life, we'll be able to send you to Nepal. Um, but it, you know, it was the college students with the youth, and that just really kind of struck out to me. And then, and I was thinking of Bailey's presentation that started this panel, right? The, those connections, um, and you know, because college can feel like a a bubble of a certain age group. So I'm just so curious if anything came up in the interviews that you did about kind of. Um, the, the missing connections or the being able to reconnect across kind of the those age groups and you know what that brought to people what that what was missing during you know during the the um surges of the pandemic when they couldn't actually physically be together even mass i'm just curious about that oh uh, sure that's a great question um so one of my findings from the research was the importance of mental health, and I didn't touch on that in the presentation, but um, that was something that came up um, in, in several interviews was just the isolation and the lack of interaction that students experienced during the COVID pandemic and the strict lockdowns in Kathmandu. Um, I think the PIE program is quite unique in the sense that it um, has this aspect where it's kind of the students from the bachelor program providing training and mentorship for these young um, primary school kids. Um, and a lot of what I uh, heard in my interviews with, with the students was that they really formed kind of a deep connection with these kids, um, as a lot of these kids from marginalized communities don't have that additional support that they need to be successful in school and to even develop themselves outside of school in activities they're interested in. Um, so I, I also saw a lot of um, personal outreach from the um, college students who are engaged in the program who would um, kind of try to go out of their way to find phone numbers of the PIE kids who are in their classes to just reach out to them to see if they're okay and and talk to them um, to make sure they don't feel so isolated and alone. And I think definitely this period um, from February to April earlier this year, um, and when the PI program was able to reopen in person was extremely important. It was, um, for many of the kids, the only education they received in the entire year and a half, um, and also the social interaction that comes along with that, yeah. Any other questions here on Zoom? Ruth, are there any coming in? Nope. I'll ask a follow-up, although each of you have kind of touched on this, but going back to Bailey's uh, presentation, when she noted that there, we, we've often been focusing on the negatives during the pandemic, and she wondered what her research might have looked like if she had looked at the positives. And I was wondering if you could share, if you, even just anecdotally, if there were positives that you saw um, in your interviews as you were conducting your research. Yeah, I can answer first. I have one that comes to mind immediately. One of the students that I interviewed was sharing that he took his classes out line, uh, outside online during COVID. Um, and the exact phrasing he used in describing it to me was, it's like my whole community is learning. And he had many people around him come and sit and enjoy his classes with him, which I think provided a really interesting take on how to approach COVID within the community. It was people he was already engaging with on a daily basis, but now they could benefit from a 
university education that's not even their own, but many of them had not had the opportunity to go to university and it created a really interesting point of dialogue for that specific student with his community to um, discuss issues that they may not have been discussing beforehand. So I think that was a beautiful silver lining that was shared with me that I will always remember. Um, in the case of uh, my research in Kathmandu, I think it's a little bit more challenging. Um, I would say one of the, the positives or the silver lining, I guess, that a lot of students um, expressed to me that they have kind of a newfound, um, uh, a newfound importance or putting a newfound importance on family and on social interaction and understanding how important that is in their daily lives and being able to create these groups outside of the school to help support each other, um, whether they're just phone calls or um, like study groups. Um, I think that's really promoted that in Kathmandu a lot more than before. Okay, hey, well, we would like to thank Tira and Kat and Bailey for joining us for our first panel. Go ahead and give them a round of applause. <laughs> okay, everyone, welcome back for our second panel of student researchers. This panel features fellows who conducted in-person research safely following all Georgetown protocols this past summer at sites inside the United States. So Julia Jackson is a senior anthropology major in the college, and she conducted research at the Rocky Mountain Land Library in Colorado through the Andretta Fellowship. Henry James studies history and philosophy in the college and traveled to the Bronx as an ESJ fellow to live with the residents of Ignacio House of Studies. Uh, that's a program of Thrive for Life, a Jesuit ministry founded by Father Zach Prasuti. And finally, Yasmin Munoz, is transferred to Georgetown after finishing her associate's degree and is now completing a bachelor's in global health. She went to Richmond, Virginia as an ESJ fellow to partner with the Sacred Heart Center, a connection made possible by Father Jack Poziadlo. So, Julia, to you. We'll follow the same format as before. Our fellows will each present for 10 minutes and then we'll invite them up for the Q&A. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Julia. As Dr. Russo said, I'm a senior in the college studying anthropology, and I did research through the Andretta Fellowship. Um, my research was titled Path Building, Examining Connection and Narrative at the Rocky Mountain Land Library. So this is me shoveling gravel at the Rocky Mountain Lab Land Library. Um, the Rocky Mountain Land Library has sites in South Park, Colorado, which is where this is, at a historic ranch, and also in Globeville, Colorado, which is a more urban um, and industrial site. So a little bit of background. This is the entryway to the ranch where I was conducting research in South Park. Here's sort of a map about the commute from Denver to South Park and a more sort of specific map about the location of the ranch in context. Um, my research was investigating specifically accessibility in outdoor spaces. So I was looking towards understandings of history and narratives of place and how that impacts who feels comfortable in outdoor spaces and how people feel comfortable relating to the landscape. And I was looking at this through the context of a proposed path on the site, which had um, accessibility impacts in a couple of different ways. So firstly, obviously physical accessibility in terms of who was able to walk on the path, that type of thing, but then also sort of more of a ephemeral accessibility in terms of the historical narrative of the land that the path is on. So we'll get a little bit more into that a bit later. But to start off, the way that I conducted this research was by conducting an ethnography of place, which is a typical sort of anthropological uh, methodological approach. Um, so it's taking ethnographic detail, which is interviews, participant observation, but then also adding the ways that place comes to specifically structure how people are interacting with each other and with the land around them. So I conducted 27 interviews with members of the Rocky Mountain Land Library community. So that was artists and ranchers, architects, a whole gamut of people. And it was really amazing to meet them all. And then I was also able to conduct participant observations. So I made line of cut prints. Um, I went on 
architectural sketch sessions, archaeological site surveys, um, and as you saw before, shoveled a lot of gravel, had a lot of fun. And this is the site in Globeville, um, where they have some of their many books. So some of you may be asking, as I was when I started this project, what is a land library? Um, and a land library is sort of a new concept, and this is kind of the first of its kind. So this is the site um, in South Park Historic Ranch that will eventually be transformed into a space linking land and community. The mission is already enacted um, as they're doing different workshops, book clubs, and that type of thing. Um, they're in the process of restoring these ranch buildings to eventually be a residential land library so that people will be staying short term, long term, that type of thing to really connect to the space and to be able to use the 50,000 plus book catalog that they have um, focusing on land and anything from poetry to biology. So to give you a little background on the land itself, Colorado is predominantly Ute land, uh, as is the site. Uh, in South Park and in Denver. Uh, the site in South Park is especially interesting because it is also an archeological site. And so it contains um, settlement from over 5,000 years in the past. So that's the early archaic to late prehistoric periods. And there's an organization in South Park called the South Park Site Stewards who would take specific care to make sure that the site isn't being interfered with so that artifacts aren't being taken, looted, that type of thing. Um, and so it's really important to consider when we're interacting with this land, the history that goes 5,000 years deep, but also into the more present, which continues through the ranching history. Um, in the 1860s, the Utes were removed from Colorado, which made a lot of room for ranching, which this soon became. Um, so in 1862, the first family moved into this space and began a ranch there. Um, they were one of the first families to begin ranching in South Park, and they established what became a very large and prosperous ranch. And what's really interesting, as Lucy said, this was not some stereotypical cowboy who did this, a badass woman did this with no resources. So the family started with Adolf and Marie Duro, but Adolf died, and it was mostly Marie who grew the ranch to be what it was. Another family took over the ranch following World War II, and now the ranch is owned by um, the city of Aurora. And so there's a lease to the land library and there's also lease for grazing. So it's still used as a ranch today, which is really interesting. So with that as our background, um, you can kind of see where I found myself. There's all of this deep history. There's so much going on here and it's super interesting to look at, but how in the world do you go about living and working in spaces like this with such a deep history, but also with this modern and future looking uh, guys. So one of the most sort of interesting things that I pulled from this research was the way that architecture and archeology span come to shape the way we understand the land that we walk on today. So architecture is so much more than just a building. Architecture is telling you a story about how you can exist in a space. And archeology span is so much more than just picking up a historic artifact and saying, this is here, this is from this person. It's telling us about who lived here and what their story was. Um, and as Callie, an architect says, there is a cultural and personal overlay of landscape that everyone is carrying around. Um, and it's really important to consider that as we interact with spaces, these spaces are dictating the way that we can understand with them, the way we can relate with other people on that space. And as we're talking about the land library in specific, because it's focused on historic preservation, it's operating in an interesting space that's taking the past and using it to shape the future as we're building architectural plans and then also shape the present as we're walking through these historic spaces. And so just as these built artifacts um, and architectural sites are dictating the way we interact with land, the land itself is also dictating how we find access to it and the ways that we are interacting with it. So for example, there is a river 
on the ranch. Um, it's the South Platte. And as I would be conducting my interviews, I'd often be walking around outside. We'd go by the river and people would be sort of talking about, you know, sometimes the grass is so high you can barely get to the river. Um, and sometimes the river is running low and it makes people wonder, you know, what's the future of this river? Are we facing these climate realities right now? Um, and so the landscape itself is dictating conversations at the ranch. And that's a really interesting thing to start thinking about. And so all of this together led me to start thinking about the ways that we exist in contested landscapes. All of the land that we live on today is contested in some way. There's history in all of these places. And the land library is a wonderful example of the way we can understand the history of land as contested, but continue to live on it, continue to make our own artifacts and continue to exist in deep relationship with it. So of course, we have questions about what it means to live on lands that has been the object of colonialism, what it means to live on lands when rural futures are confusing and uncertain in this country. But the land library shows us that when we exist in a respectful and reciprocal way with the land that we can continue to live on it and continue to learn from it as we are existing here. Um, and so as I'm sort of thinking towards the future, I think the land library provides us with an important understanding of how we can look and live in a responsible way with deep connection to space. So I just want to thank you all for listening. Thank you so much to the land library for allowing me to participate in research there. And thank you so much to the Andretta family and the CSJ for allowing this research to take place. Hi everyone, my name is Henry James. I spent this past month of July living in the Bronx at a transitional house for men who started their college careers in prison. The house was administered by Thrive for Life Prison Project. Uh, Dr. Wister briefly introduced them. So uh, you can see the house in the background here. Um, a little bit about myself. I'm a senior in the college, a history major, philosophy minor, and my historical studies focus on the 1960s in America and the politics of poverty. Uh, I also run a program here called Georgetown Ballers, where a group of students who on the weekends during non-COVID times travel to New Beginnings Youth Development Center to first play basketball with the young men incarcerated there and then eat dinner with them, our goal being to develop relationships. Uh, first, is a statistic for some context, 67% of those incarcerated will return to prison within three years, whereas only 2% of graduates from Mercy College, uh, Mercy College's program ever go back. Mercy College is the educational partner of Sing Sing Corre Correctional Facility, which is one of the prisons that feeds Ignacio House. Um, so my project was aimed at looking at what it is qualitatively about education that changes potentially how a person thinks and how they make decisions and why it is that there is such stark statistics about recidivism and educational programs. I should also note, there's probably some self-selection bias going on here. Guys who are open to starting college and prison might already be a little bit less likely to return when they get out. Nevertheless, uh, I set out to investigate if there was something about the classes they were taking that was changing how they were thinking. So a little bit about the house. I was founded in 2019 by Father Zach Prasuti. He's a Jesuit of the New York province. Um, it began as an organization doing religious retreats in six correctional facilities throughout New York State, teaching Ignatian spirituality to the men incarcerated. Uh, while I was living at the house, there were 10 residents. Uh, so the first research question I touched on a little bit, how do these programs change, if at all, how a person thinks? This can be perception of circumstance, decision-making, view of the future. The second part of my project, which I'm not going to talk about as much today, uh, is looking at how Ignacio House goes about creating a culture in a transitional environment. So this is not meant to be a permanent living space. It's meant for people to come and be for a year, two years maybe, and then move on. Um, and there's also this, this phenomenon I heard a lot about from residents and administrators, somewhat of a cultural hangover, if you will, of guys leaving prison. Um, in prison, being closed, guarded, not sharing anything that's going to make you vulnerable are things that are incentivized. Living in a communal environment, um, those things are, are not helpful at all, right? Um, to be on, in honest and open communication with those around you is something that, um, from residents I heard, is something that needs to be actively engaged. 
uh, for people returning from prison. Uh, there are two main streams uh, of residents in Ignacio House. The first is the religious retreats I mentioned, and the second are educational partners um, listed here on the screen. I conducted in-person semi-structured interviews with residents, the founder, administrators on site, and then also spiritual mentors who are outside citizens who volunteer their time to be a resource for men returning home. I lived at the house for three weeks. So um, I wasn't just an outside interviewer. I was also participating in the activities of the house. Uh, we went to museums together, played basketball, um, went to a Yankees game. Um, so I was doing more than just asking questions uh, with these men. Uh, today, I'm going to focus on one guy's story that I met. His name is Quentin. Um, this is us in Battery Park um, one afternoon while I was in the Bronx. And these are some of his quotes. I'm going to touch on each uh, while talking about his story. So Quentin dropped out of high school in 11th grade. Um, he told me he was mad at the world growing up. He felt like he had been dealt a bad hand. Uh, he had a chip on his shoulder, and he had nothing to lose. Uh, and to him, that's how he got caught up in the activities that he did and he landed in prison. Um, but he, he focused on these two really interesting words, which were choice and voice, uh, when telling me about how his mindset changed after he went and began his college career. I'm gonna let him tell you about that himself. It was through education that I actually discovered that I have a voice, you know, that I have the ability to change things. You know, I, the most profound thing that I've learned through that whole experience up until now is that the power of choice. It makes sense now that I don't have to be a product of my environment. Why not create, you know, a lane where I can be a product of my success? All right, so a couple important pieces of context within that quote. The first is a lot of the college programs conducted in prison focus on courses that um, talk a lot about psychology and the impact that environment has on behavior. Um, and Q told me that when he started learning about the environment that he grew up in, his life, and these are his words, started to make sense. And for me, one of the most powerful parts of his story is that he actually went back to prison. He violated his parole and had to go back to prison for six months. And when I heard him talk about that experience, this, this first uh, finding that, that education can change one's perception of their circumstance was really proven in Q's case because he told me about how he came to view that as a necessary step in his journey. Uh, he, he was obviously deeply humiliated and upset by that turn of events, but he told me about how he quickly bounced back and, and viewed it as part of the, his journey and part of his process. So I thought that's where, you know, the rubber hit the road, if you will. And, and it was his, his mindset had really changed and there was evidence of it. Um, the, or my second finding I want to focus on, and I should mention all three of these findings were common threads across the board with multiple residents that I interviewed. I'm only going to mention Q's name and I don't want to repeat that, but every guy almost that I interviewed mentioned these three things. Education can offer a different community in prison. A lot of the guys I spoke to talked about the role that gang affiliations were playing even when they began their sentences. When they began their educational programs though, all of a sudden a new avenue to interact with those around them opened up. Um, I heard a lot about the specific spaces that class took place and that the studying hours took place and just how much time guys would spend in there. They would spend their whole afternoon, their whole days in those spaces, talking about assignments, doing their work. And I've heard professors of mine here at Georgetown tell me about how their students in prison are actually the best students they ever have. They're working much harder than any other students they've ever encountered and are that much more engaged in their subject material as they're trying to better themselves. Uh, and I heard that in these responses. Um, Q also used this word to describe his interactions with other students and professors. It was like magic, uh, which I thought was, was an incredible phrase. Um, and the last finding I want to talk about is at the end of each guy's journey, everyone told me about the importance of paying what they had learned forward, that what they had learned wasn't of 
value unless they passed it on to the guys coming after them. And in the context of Ignacio House, where I was living, this actually took place. I was, I was living there while a new resident came and I, I actually went to the prison um, to pick him up. And when, I, when, I, when, when he got back to the house, the first night there was a dinner where that value was on full display. I mean, guys actively welcomed this new member into their community. Um, and in Q's case, he started an organization called Say Word, and it's aimed at individualizing approaches to reentry. Um, in, in Q's view, the one size fits all model that a lot of reentry organizations have is not adequately setting up um, former prisoners who are coming home up for success. Um, and the last thing I want to mention is this this rehabilitation versus habilitation um, debate that I engaged a lot of the residents in, many told me about how they had never been habilitated for the first time. So they think, they think there's a fundamental problem with the word rehabilitation and that we need to start saying habilitation because where they came from, the environments they grew up in, they were not prepared. They were not given the opportunities, the skills, to succeed. And so they really think about their place in life as the first time they're being habilitated. Um, Q at one point said that his interactions with his professors and his students and his fellow students made him feel like he was part of something larger than himself. And um, I absolutely felt like that uh, during my time at the house. So I want to thank you all for listening. And I also really want to thank the residents of Ignacio House for welcoming me and so generously telling me their stories. Buenas tardes, good afternoon everyone. Oh, my mask. <laughs> Buenas tardes, good afternoon everyone. I'm Yasmin Munoz and today I will be talking to you about my education and social justice project at Sacred Heart Center. So first, a little about me. I'm a senior in the School of Nursing and Health Studies, majoring in global health, and I'm a proud Mexican-American daughter of immigrants from a single-parent low-income household in Dallas, Texas, which means that my family has experienced and struggled with issues like poverty, food insecurity, housing instability, mental illness, and domestic violence, which have all led me to find uh, strength and kindness from advocates willing to help us tackle these very issues and how I've seen firsthand the incredible impact that volunteers, organizations, and policies can have on individuals. And so that's a big reason for why I am so interested in all things social justice, especially education, health, and immigration. And it is also why I am so involved in things like the Georgetown Scholars Program, where um, I've been advocating um, in the student board for the past two years uh, for an equitable college experience for first generation and low income students like myself and why as the eldest of eight, I found it so fulfilling to serve um, for the past two years in uh, under-resourced communities in DC, uh, providing early childhood uh, literacy programming um, through the AmeriCorps Jumpstart program, and why I am currently interning at the Pan American Health Organization looking at how uh, artificial intelligence is being utilized uh, during COVID-19 and how this can be used um, in the future for crisis response in the Latin American region, which um, all just culminates into my pairing with Sacred Heart Center or El Centro Sagrado Corazón in Richmond, Virginia, which provides a lot of the services that my family has required throughout the years. And so I lived in downtown uh, Richmond, um, which was a 30 minute free bus ride away from the site uh, just south uh, past the uh, James River. And I found myself in this center that was uh, founded in 1990 by the Maryland province Jesuits and Catholic Diocese of, of Richmond. Uh, they started by providing uh, after school and day programming for uh, children um, of low and moderate incomes um, and adults as well. They started with education programming, later fostered uh, partnerships to help address health needs. And then in 2011, they recentered their programming to uh, serve the growing Latinx population in Richmond because they found that the Latinx population was experiencing higher rates of poverty 
um, when compared to all the other racial and ethnic groups in the area. So they officially adopted their mission to connect Latinos with the tools to, to thrive and flourish, which really inspired a lot of my research. And so I spent three weeks conducting in-person fieldwork at the center. I conducted eight Spanish and four English semi-structured um, in-person and virtual interviews. And so I interviewed staff, administration, donors, and families being served with the overwhelming majority being immigrant women of color. And I also got the opportunity to interact with volunteers and families. Um, by uh, distributing um, and packaging um, culturally curated food um, items that are just staples in Latin cuisine. So think tortillas, corn flour, rice, beans, and the like. And like I mentioned, um, my research primarily focused on how the center was fulfilling its mission during the crisis with secondary objectives being um, to understand and identify the challenges they faced as well as the response to those challenges and the effects to the response to the challenges uh, for the center and the community. And I'll primarily focus on the challenges and um, how their mission aided in addressing them. So I really found that uh, there were unique challenges disproportionately affecting the Latinx population with those issues, including immigration status. So a big part of the Latinx experience is um, being uh, threatened um, by deportation and subsequent income loss because of their undocumented status um, and the um, exclusion of uh, being um, um, the exclusion of their inclusion in the uh, COVID relief packages, um, at least during the Trump administration. And that's either because they were undocumented or because they lived in a mixed status household that included family members that were both um, uh, with different degrees of citizenship status. Uh, they also um, unfortunately had higher rates of unemployment, either because of existing job insecurity due, the, due to their status or because of the typically held service industry jobs that did experience high rates of unemployment, especially at the beginning. And um, this was only <laughs> exacerbated by um, the fact that uh, they were already experiencing um, higher rates of poverty with the typical family seeking assistance from the center being a five person single parent household where um, most, uh, half if not most of that paycheck was going toward childcare expenses. So imagine living paycheck to paycheck and then being unable to surpass poverty um, due to the fact that um, we were in a time of crisis and unfortunately, enrichment of specifically um, Latinos were more likely to contract, um, be hospitalized and die due to COVID uh, for various reasons. And they also uh, experienced a language barrier that decreased their accessibility to resources um, provided by other organizations and the local government. Thankfully, Sacred Heart Center's mission was crucial in acknowledging and empowering um, Latinos during uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So um, they really took advantage of the um, center and community's assets um, and generous donations by angel donors, um, around half a million dollars to create this emergency relief programming during this time. And so you have the Latinx population, which already is so community driven and collectivistic and a center specifically intentionally targeting the Latinx population um, that really made it possible to just naturally uh, create programming that address the immediate concerns of community members um, for that were experiencing, um, you know, eviction, medical bills, rising utility bill uh, debt and food insecurity and through um, data gathered from the inception, so April 2020 through February 2021, they did find that they helped over 800 families, which turned out to be around 3,200 individuals um, that were assisted more than once for varying reasons, and that uh, received a total aid of over $900,000 within that 46-week period. 
And this is incredibly important because you had stories from families um, like participant before who say, thank God that the center never left me because um, I really um, couldn't do it by myself. I tell you, there are times when I despair. I felt like I couldn't take it anymore. I had no drive. There are times when I didn't even want to get up because I felt frustrated when I saw the bells. And this is a similarly shared sentiment by the Latina driven leadership at the center who are just so grateful to um, work with, um, you know, within their community. And um, even though they didn't experience, you know, being undocumented or having um, experiencing hunger or being unable to uh, study, um, they did understand and want to elevate um, members of their community. So Sacred Heart Center really showed that it is possible to fulfill this need for sustainable community inspired context specific programming for the Latinx population, especially during times of crisis. And that is all. Thank you so much to everyone for listening and for Sacred Heart Center for um, um, helping me throughout this process. Thank you. I'm sure there are questions on here, but of course I'm gonna start you with mine. Um, Okay, we heard a space came up in all three of your presentations, okay? The, a land library. I've lived in Colorado. I'd never even heard of a land library. I'm terribly embarrassed, right? But this, I mean, it's actually a physical space, but you showed us these beautiful vistas, right? Then we went to the Bronx, this space of this house. But then, Henry, you also told us about the spaces where the the incarcerated men would study and learn inside the prison. And Yasmin, your pictures bringing us to this center, right? Which I just feel like center is just enlivened the word center in such a new way for me, right? Yet in the last year and a half, our spaces have been so limited. And I'm just so curious what this effect had on you. I mean, to be in a new space after it was probably at that point 14 15 months of being kind of contained in one or two spaces whether that was home or on campus or you know things like that so that's what I'm curious about this idea of space but I want to hear the questions from you too so who wants to start off that's right Oh, thank you so much. So I was thrilled to be able to go somewhere. I've never taken the train before. So I took a train right there. That was super exciting. I got there and really I did try to demonstrate in my presentation just how colorful and lively, especially the Latinx population is already known for uh, being. Um, it was, it felt so good to be in these classrooms conducting interviews with, you know, people who occupied the space. And the center unfortunately was, has been closed. Um, the only thing open was the new established food bank that occurred during this time but it was still so good seeing staff there and volunteers there and I'm just like oh I, I'm gonna go I'm gonna go back I'm gonna go back because I mean upon entrance I did feel this just like this warm hug that I've kept hearing a lot of the staff describe um, by the people and you know I just being in the classrooms walking through those halls I really felt like oh I can't imagine what this was like pre-COVID because um just I felt it already. I felt the presence uh, of love and, you know, just support. And I'm going to go back to see that in person when the center is uh, officially opened back um, to be able to feel um, uh, that to an even uh, higher, higher degree. But that's just a little about me <laughs> and that space. Yeah, I love what you're saying about love and being in spaces where you can really feel that because I had a similar sort of experience. Um, when I think about this space, I think about the last day of my field work when I was up at the ranch um, and just how I felt leaving and like looking out of the car as I was like pulling out for the last time, um, knowing that I want to come back and will be coming back, but understanding that this moment of the summer was such a appointed space um, and being able to be up at the ranch on a weekly basis and see the changes the seasons brought. And that was something that I feel like is seasons affect all of our lives. And yet I was looking at it through a lens um, that was very privileged in being able to study this as my main goal for this entire summer. And so I felt like the connection that I was able to establish was one that was so lucky to just be able to take the time to sit outside and think about existing in spaces um, and to talk to people about those same spaces. So I, one of my interview questions 
for some folks was, you know, what space do you keep coming back to every time you're at the ranch? Um, and for me, it was the river. Um, as you all saw, it's one of my favorite spaces. Um, and I, on the last day, just had to go and like put my feet in the river and say like a thank you to that space because it meant so much to me this summer. And as I've been writing and thinking more about this in reflection, just being able to write about that space has taken me back in a way that's really beautiful and that I hope my presentation was able to convey a little bit. Yeah, this was a really wonderful question, Dr. Lister, because there are actually a ton of spaces at Ignacio House that I didn't get to talk about. The first and most important that I'll mention is the backyard during COVID was actually transformed completely. They took what had previously been a pile of dirt and a slab of concrete and turned it into a three-tiered garden, a literal oasis in the middle of the Bronx, um, fully equipped with a gazebo, with a vegetable garden. I mean, it's incredible. And it was actually a crew of residents at the house. The founder told me about how at the beginning of the pandemic, a lot of guys lost their jobs. And he made a commitment one of those first nights that he wasn't going to let the residents go without work. Uh, and he put them to work at the house. Uh, and that space is just absolutely remarkable. There's also three common spaces in the bottom of each basement of each of the three buildings. One's a learning center equipped with a huge library. One's a rec room um, where I worked out with some of the guys a couple of times. And the last one's a dining room, which uh, is the host of a Sunday meal every week. Uh, and I would, I would just say the spaces there really embody the principle that human dignity comes with our spaces. Uh, and that's something the founder told me about a couple of times that he believes um, the apartment that these men returning home should live in um, should be roughly equal to what other people are living in in New York City. It shouldn't be any different. Okay, audience online or audience here IRL? <laughs> Do we have anything? Father Chris, I think you probably have a question. Why don't you come up and then we'll get the audience from the question from the audience um, from Zoom. Well, I, to give you, I have to give you that. Sorry. It's for the video. Yes. So that one. Yeah. So I wonder um, how yourself, how you found yourself being transformed, being there. So you went in all kinds of different spaces, different periods of time. So what changed for yourself as you yeah, look back? Uh, I would say I spent a lot of time in the library in one of the basements um, at night. And I think one of the takeaways from the project for me is I, told, I talked a little bit about that those statistics are really stark. And there's probably some degree of just selection bias occurring with those. Um, but I think these men really illustrate that. Um, they, they've come to a point where they're making decisions reflectively. Um, and I found myself becoming a lot more reflective in that environment. To me, there's, there's no difference between where, and there's no difference in how I'm thinking currently in a lot of situations in my life and how they were probably thinking when they were my age. The difference is in the choices presented to us. Um, so I found myself reflecting a lot on that and just how, you know, far I have to, to go as, a, as an individual and how inspiring those stories are. Yeah, I found a, a lot of that aspect of reflection as well. And something that I think really changed for me was my ability to tolerate mess, not in an actual space, but more sort of ideologically. Um, I think it's easy to want to categorize things into neat boxes. Um, and something that this project showed me was how complex things can be and how things can take on multiple meanings and multiple purposes um, and how that complexity and richness can be so much more interesting than just having quick labels for things and so it, but being back on campus and being able to recognize that has been so helpful for me in navigating just like life back in person again as well so it's been a really sort of helpful project to keep that in mind as well 
And uh, for me, I, um, I went in wanting to learn everything um, as much as possible from the people, from the community, from the center, from Richmond. Um, so I really felt so incredibly fortunate to be able to, for the first time in my life, actually interact on an academic level with my community. I felt like before this, I felt, I honestly have felt like disconnected. Um, and the kind of work that I have been doing um, because it never specifically focused on the Latinx population. So I found it so fulfilling to be able to, you know, put on my Spanish brain and just like work all communication um, and like writing, you know, translating um, everything um, from uh, Spanish to English. So just being able to do, to do that and just re reinvigorating my own personal um, drive and passion for wanting to do this kind of work in the future and um, just further working with my community and just feeling so incredibly proud um, uh, to the point where I've come and I'm um, seeing uh, that there are other people like me um, carrying this fight right now and that I'll be able to be a part of it soon enough. Julia, the ESJ fellows, we kind of all tease and encourage each other with like, what are the titles of the books that we are going to write and when the poets are for. So I, I can't wait for the book titled Ideological Mess. Like I could, I, it would be, could I do like one of the captions on the back, like a quote, that would be awesome. Okay. Um, so one of the questions that came in um, from the audience on Zoom was just, you know, Julia, 27 interviews, that's a lot. Dr. Craig and I talked to Yasmin at some point, and we had encouraged, you know, interviews of half hour, 45 minutes, and Yasmin's are like, oh, no, mine are two, three hours. We're going to do some follow-ups, right? Um, and Henry, I mean, you lived with these men, right? I mean, not just interviewed them. Like you said, you, you played basketball with them. You went to the Yankees game with them, all of that. I mean, the Giants would be upset with you. Were they playing the Giants? They weren't playing the Giants. Okay. Anyway, inside joke. Um, can, can you take us, and I, we loved your quotations. Can you take us to a, a moment in an interview? You know, give yourself a, a second to think about that, but can you take us to a moment, like in one of those 27 interviews, one of those hour long interviews that, that you think will stay with you? Because that is the method that we use for the ESJ fellowship and clearly one of the methods, really, and not the only one that you are using in your, in your Andretta fellowship in Colorado. So can you just take us to a moment uh, in an interview and share that with us if you feel comfortable doing so? And then we'll probably wrap it up at that, okay? One of the residents told me that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, he told that to me twice. Once was on the car ride when he was coming home, actually, for the first time. He'd been in prison for 20 years. And the second time was in an individual interview. Um, and that really speaks to the culture that he had been instrumental in creating in the prison that he was in. Um, and it also speaks to the differences and discrepancies between prisons in New York State. Some are really program heavy, meaning they bring a lot of vendors in from the outside. Some are very focused on punishment. And um, I heard from several guys who had been in both that the former is just completely different uh, than the latter. And his quote, to me will always illustrate that and just just how important it is for our prisons to be program heavy so one of the moments i think it speaks to the mess that i was talking about earlier um in in one of my interviews it was an interview with one of the site stewards um and she had been living in Fair Play, which is a community near the ranch for almost her entire life um and i was expecting to come into this interview and talk to her about archaeology, um, what that meant. And of course, that's what we talked about a little bit, but she also shared with me what it was like living in Fair Play at the time. And she told me about a kegger that they had had at that ranch when it was still a ranch. Um, and it blew my mind. I had been thinking in these um, very tight ways, you know, there is this indigenous history, and then there's a ranching history, and now there's this present moment. And then 
she completely changed the way I was looking at this. This was a space where people had always been communing, gathering, people are still gathering. Um, and it just changed the way I was thinking about the land and it made me feel so much more connected to the space um, in a way that made me recognize that though you know the people who were living there 5,000 years ago, I don't know who they were. I don't know. I will never know all of the people who have walked on this space. That's not within my comprehension. But I do know what it is to be a human and to live in communal spaces and to have relationships with other people. And, and she showed me that, you know, these people, you know, but, but during when it was a ranch, before then, like, there are still people. And sort of thinking that way allowed me to embrace a much more sort of empathetic and understanding way to look at this space throughout time. And for me, it was just this recurring time in every interview from the two hour to like just the 30 minute, I'm on the phone, I'm driving somewhere, a kind of calls. In every single like one of those um, interviews, I just, there always came a point where everyone would just be like, oh, I I'm talking too much. Like, and I'm, and I'm like, I'm here to listen. And uh, yeah, for, this is the first time um, I've taken the moment to speak these things out loud. And it means so much to have you here listening to me. And uh, I'm just, that really made me think about how um, fast paced the world can be, how inundated with all the different priorities um, one can be uh, living life. Um, but just how special it is to listen to someone because it's not just listening. You are taking in the voice of someone who isn't heard often and especially when um, you're working with uh, marginalized populations. I think that's incredibly important to just take the time to be like, hey, I'm interested in your story. What is your story? Um, not even like an informal interview setting, but um, just casually, I've, I found this great importance and love for uh, reaching out to people and just being like, hey, how are you doing? Um, so I really, I really loved that, uh, taking that away from my interviews. Welcome back for our third and final panel of our Global Social Justice Research Symposium. This panel takes us through the educational lifespan of a student during the COVID-19 pandemic. Tommy Taravainen, a senior government major in the college, will start us off. Tommy went to Nativity Prep, a middle school in Boston, Massachusetts this summer. Special thanks to Hoya Kevin Sullivan for this connection. Gabby Villadolid graduated in May with her degree in Justice and Peace Studies and conducted her ESJ research at her Jesuit high school alma mater in San Francisco. Gabby is joining us by Zoom. And finally, Amber Stanford, one of our other 2020 ESJ fellows, is a graduate of the college and currently a Marshall Scholar pursuing her graduate degrees in the United Kingdom. Amber pivoted during the pandemic to partner virtually with our Jesuit higher education peer, Universidad Antonio Ruiz de Montoya in Lima, Peru. She will also join us via Zoom. Tommy, do you wanna go ahead and come on up? All right. Hello everyone. Um, my name is Tommy Teravainen and I'm a senior in the college studying government. And I, was, uh, I had the honor of being a 2021 education and social justice research fellow this summer. And it's been amazing learning about everyone else's research so far. And I'm excited to share with you a little bit about my experience at Nativity Prep in Boston and my research and time spent there. So like I mentioned, I was selected to be, and I had the honor to be a 2021 Education and Social Justice Research Fellow. And I was partnered with the Nativity Preparatory School of Boston or Nativity Prep for short. And I'll talk a little bit more about the school's model and its mission on the next few slides. And I'm also a senior graduating this spring, unfortunately. I'm a government major, history minor, and science, technology, and international affairs minor. And my connections to the CSJ um, first happened through DC Reads and my involvement with the After School Kids program, which are both um, literacy programs and tutoring for high school students and elementary school students. So, and I'm also from Massachusetts. So my pairing with Nativity Prep in Boston was a good fit based on those aspects. And so a little bit just about the context and history behind the school. Um, the nativity model is found in around 65 
you typically middle schools throughout the country and 17 of which are specifically Jesuit. And this model is based on small class sizes. The entire school is around only, I'd say 100 students and it's grades four through eight. Um, and then it's tuition free, tuition free private education. And a lot of these are based on extensive after school programming and opportunities to engage the students beyond just your typical eight to three school day. And so um, the first of these schools was established in the Lower East Side of Manhattan in 1970. And so this school's unfortunately had to be closed in 2011 due to rapid gentrification of the area around it. And the school was no longer needed to serve this population of students. So because of this, this makes Nativity Prep in Boston the longest running of the Nativity schools when it was established in 1990 to meet the needs of um, underserved populations of students throughout Boston. And since then, there's been a ton of changes and it's adapted to the varying landscape of Boston, which I'll touch on in the next slide as well. But it has started, it has um, gained a professional salaried teaching staff in addition to its volunteers, which make up um, huge contributions to the school and its mission and a graduate support office. And it has exp expanded to include fourth and fifth grade classes in addition to sixth through eighth. And so my research was mainly convened on looking at this mission statement in action, which motivates and elevates a lot of the work being done by staff, teachers, um, teaching fellows, and students themselves. And as you can read um, the mission statement over here, my main focus on this was the last phrase, which was, and to become compassionate men for others, because this is... I was looking at two theoretical frameworks that motivate a lot of the work within Nativity Prep, and I'll talk about the next one in two slides. But um, basically, I was trying to understand how service plays a role in spe specific actionables beyond just a blanket mission statement. And so, like I was saying, um, Nativity has adapted to a dynamic, the dynamic shifts in demographics of Boston. So originally the school started in the neighborhood of Roxbury. And this is actually where I, I was staying about three blocks away from the original building. And I would take the T or like the Boston subway about three stops um, to over to Jamaica Plain where the school relocated to. And so this um, shift and move away from Roxbury is evidence of how place-based um, the mission statement really is like some of our other research fellows have been talking about. And so they were trying to move closer to the populations that they were serving. And now, unfortunately, Jamaica Plain has been experiencing rapid gentrification as well. And this is causing most of the students to have to commute from neighborhoods such as Dorchester, Mattapan, and Hyde Park. And as you can see here, this is a map that details um, specific locales where students are within the city of Boston. Because as it says in the mission statement, their goal is to serve students and make boys and men for others from within the city of Boston. Okay, so this next theoretical framework that I was referring to is known as the grad at grad pillars. And as a Jesuit school, this plays an integral role um, since they're the students enrollment in fourth grade. And they are taught these in varying capacities. They start out just going over them and just knowing what each one means. And as you can see here, open to growth, intellectually competent, religious, loving, and the main focus of my research, which was a commitment to doing justice. And so it was pretty funny to see how this evolves throughout the students' time as well, because you start off with these fourth graders who can just list them off, and they all know them pretty well, for the most part. And then we get to eighth grade, where these students are really providing me with some detailed answers and responses of how they live out these um, different aspects of the grad at grad pillars in their everyday lives, as well as through specific programming at school, and how they use that to help the mission or help the pillars become ingrained in a part of the lives of the younger students as well. And so as you can see here, um, I had an amazing time in Boston and I had the honor of being able to spend three weeks um, staying at actually the Marriott Inn with a complimentary breakfast, um, <laughs> about three train stops away from Nativity Prep. And so um, like I, my cohort of three other fellows, we received a extensive instruction and qualitative data collection and analysis. And that's included 3-1 credit courses, which we enrolled now. And we're working on getting that um, engaged scholarship report done. Hopefully that will be finished by the end of the semester. Yeah, hopefully. It will. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, 
I did about 30 plus interviews and focus groups actually. And so what I would do is I convened about groups of three to five students and did a semi-structured focus group discussion, um, exploring their experiences with social justice and commitment to justice, doing justice within the context of nativity. And this also included participant observation, which ranged from kickball games to dip dyeing a bunch of Puma shoes that were donated by a generous donor, and as well as student retreats, which occurred on Fridays. And that involved a ton of fun games and just getting to know the kids a bit more as well as their teachers. And as we mentioned earlier, um, Kevin Sullivan is to thank um, as our site contact and coordinator for this research partnership. And he was serving as the director of advancement at Nativity while I was there, but he has now moved on to other positions within Georgetown, actually. So I hope you're watching, Kevin. Hi. <laughs> okay. Now, my actual research questions, like I mentioned, I was focused on parsing out how this mission statement is lived out day to day in Nativity in a multifaceted manner, because we have this idea that the school itself is an act of service through offering this tuition free education and all this great programming for students. But then I was also trying to look at how this is actually making students themselves become men for others and an inspiration to service. And so this took on my primary goal as well as secondary goals, which was looking at the role of volunteering within um, the teaching fellow staff and the students themselves, and also how the interests and needs of their families and parents are incorporated into the framework because nativity is dedicated to taking on this holistic model of the nativity model education and my findings oh and this photo is actually a picture right outside of the t-stop and it once again like the importance of place took center stage here um, as we are family because my main finding here was relationships are everything at nativity and community um, underscored almost every single interview and focus group that I convened with my students, staff, teachers, but that was the main driving force here, as well as this idea that the mission statement is there, and just the school existing in itself, it's living that out, but what are the active components to better this and increase engagement with service and living out the statement day to day, as well as the fact that Nativity has conducted substantive work on social and racial justice in adapting to these constantly shifting demographics and needs of the students, especially within the context of the COVID-19 pandemic as well, given the challenges of providing the education and all the programming that Nativity has to offer. And so I'm gonna also provide you with some specific quotes from interviews. So here we have Nora Frias, who was the pilot of the Graduate Support Office, which is a crucial component of the Nativity at Prep education. And so the Graduate Support Office will actually help follow alumni after they graduate Nativity through their time in high school, college, and careers, and connect them back with current Nativity students. And so supporting my primary finding, relationship building was at the core of all of her work, whether it was her going to attending disciplinary meetings, advocating for students in high school, helping them allocate different scholarships and financial aid opportunities, and navigating um, predominantly white institutions in high school and college as low income students of color. And so this was an amazing part of her work and is crucial and the office is expanding and it's now two people and they're hoping to upgrade it to three in the near future. And then the second part, she highlighted how there's always gonna be more work to be done because this is such a dynamic space of education working up with these, these students and a educational landscape as competitive as Boston as well. So as you can see in her second quote, she highlights the need to always better themselves and keep that mission in the forefront of their minds working every day. And so my next quotes that I'm looking at are coming from my eighth grade focus group, which was probably the most coherent out of the focus groups I had. My fourth graders, the, when I was trying to listen back to the audio, it was mostly screaming and asking to play, and I don't know what was going on. But my eighth graders had some really thoughtful and reflective answers, as you can see here. And these help highlight some of my secondary findings. Um, and these were actually twins I found out halfway through the focus group, Hilton and Hillary, as well as Zion. And so they shared with me about their experiences of really connecting with teachers of color and the importance of bringing back um, Nativity students themselves to serve as teachers and the teaching fellows as well, because they have a two year teaching fellowship program. And so as you can see, Hillary expressed like this connection to all these teachers of color and how important these were in formulating their time at Nativity. 
And Zion was even excited about being able to come back at some point and return to serve students in the capacity that he was able to participate in during his time at Nativity. This was a, my most powerful focus group with students. And so takeaways from this, um, as you can see here, these are the dip dyed shoes I talked about. They're really cool and I wanna try this out sometime. But um, a holistic commitment to service is lived out every single day by teachers, staff, and students. And this is evident throughout my interviews and focus groups of them constantly trying to better themselves and work on this mission and how they can enact this and the challenges given the COVID pandemic and how what the future of this looks like. And so next steps based on this landscape of Boston and nativity always trying to better themselves is perhaps a relocation closer to the communities that are currently being served by the school and or an expansion to include new populations of students who could benefit from this nativity education. And so also the graduate support office remained a vital component of nativity through and through. And this was evident through my talk, my interview with Nora, the students, as well as I had the opportunity to chat with a few alumni and alumni returned to the school all the time while I was there. Um, there's just three alumni who stopped by there in high school now and they came to share their experiences with me. But another thing that really emerged from this is for most people, you wanna forget your middle school experience entirely, but for nativity, they're gonna be there with you for the rest of your life. And I thought that that was really interesting and powerful. And so I wanted to thank the Center for Social Justice, the Berkeley Center, Dr. Craig and Dr. Whistler, Kevin Sullivan, and my fellow fellows and having the opportunity to conduct this research. So thank you. All right, I'll, I'll go ahead and get started. So hello everyone. Uh, my name is Gabby Villadelid. Thank you for tuning into my presentation. Um, I'm a 2020 ESJ fellow um, and I wish I was there at the Hilltop with you all. Before I begin, I just want to thank Dr. Craig and Dr. Whistler, fellow presenter Tiara Hatfield. And um, of course, Director Maricel Hernandez and the Modest community who have helped me along this journey and allowed this challenging and fruitful research to happen. So for my project, I have the honor of researching the Modest Center for Equity and Inclusion, which is the, the diversity office of my Jesuit High School, St. Ignatius College Prep in San Francisco. It's located in the Sunset District, specifically the Outer Sunset neighborhood, which has a majority demographic of Asian and white residents according to 2019 statistics. Okay. Uh, the Modest Center has been operating for over 30 years. It first began as a summer program designed to enhance diversity at SI in 1973 and was later renamed Modest in 2000. Its programming primarily exists to serve SI community members who fit any Modest profile traits, which are first-generation college-bound students, students of a low income background and students of color who are historically underrepresented in higher education. In 2017, the Modest Center merged with the Office of Equity and Inclusion. So in addition to serving Modest profile members, the office partners with other departments and community groups to handle issues of equity and inclusion. To give some examples of this, Modest serves Modest profile students in its main high school program, which offers academic counseling, mentorship, and college prep resources and opportunities, as well as cultural events and similar equivalents are offered for modest parents to participate in. And affinity group programming is offered for all groups of faculty and staff, students and parents. And for faculty and staff, modest supports in areas such as professional development and curriculum development. And finally, modest also advocates on behalf of students and families. So of course, it's important for me to acknowledge my position my positionality um, and connection to my research site as I'm a graduate of the class of 2017, that's me with um, my choral group. Um, as a Filipino American, the Modest Center's resources were available to me, but I was not an active participant in Modest programming aside from attending a few college workshops with friends. However, I had many friendships and connections at my four years at SI with Modest peers and faculty members, which all placed me in a unique position to be familiar with the modest community and programming while still be able, while also learning um, more deeply about community members' experiences while researching. Luckily, one of the modest connections I made was the current director and my former AP statistics teacher, Director Hernandez, 
Due to the pandemic causing unforeseen delays in the research process, I was unable to start until uh, March of this year. Um, but fortunately, I was able to reach out to Ms. Hernandez and quickly get started. Using both hers and my own connections, I reached out to SI administrators, um, MAGIS faculty, MAGIS parents, and recent MAGIS alumni with varying levels of participation and conducted 20 total virtual interviews. And this all took place um, during March to April of 2021, as our nation is witnessing the rise in social movements calling for racial justice in the aftermath of racial tragedies. Thus, my research questions and interviewee responses are connected to present experiences. So my primary research question is, how do current and recently graduated members of the MAGIS community conceptualize equity and inclusion? And I've bolded my secondary questions, what meaning, what meaning does its physical space hold? And how does the MAGIS Center's equity and inclusion work enact racial justice? As the rest of this presentation will focus on some key findings related to these questions. So a common theme that was reiterated throughout all interviewee groups was the acknowledgement of environment and space. Despite the statistic that over 50% of the student body identifies as BIPOC, interviewees across groups brought up that the school environment and culture feels predominantly white based on the private school's history, its donor population, and all the way down to who is represented and who appears to integrate more easily into high school life. This contextualizes observations made by 80% of interviewees that inside and around the Magis Center's physical office, um, pictured here uh, with the red circle, um, is a visibly racialized space on campus, located in the corner of the student center, which is what this picture is of, one of the largest and busiest sections of school where students study, socialize, and pass by during breaks and after school, interviewees identify the place as a safe space or affinity space where BIPOC students or members can gather. One of the main points that interviewees across all groups discussed was the view that the Magis Center space was a social community resource that helped to build inclusiveness and community. In tandem with being called a BIPOC safe space, it was often described as a home and a place where Magis family could come together to socialize and feel affirmed in their identities and shared experiences, which was critical for getting through the day to day. Admin, Magis faculty, and alumni also noted that the physical space itself was welcoming and not exclusive to BIPOC members, as some non-BIPOC or non-MAGIS profile identifying students would also frequent and find community in the space. However, while reflecting on broader community interactions with the space, interviewees not noted tensions with space and community. On the more neutral end, interviewees noted that some non-MAGIS members tended to avoid or limit interacting with the MAGIS space out of the desire to be sensitive to intention but the space and resources were primarily catered towards BIPOC members or out of lack of awareness about MAGIS and its programs. Stemming from this lack of awareness on the more negative end, interviewees across groups observed attitudes of skepticism as to why the space was there and how exclusive it was, overheard stigmatizing descriptions of the space in school tours and in classrooms such as MAGIS being where the kids of color meet or where the low-income kids go, as well as opinions of the space being self-segregating and not conducive to being part of the greater community. These tensions are exemplified in this quote by an alumni who stated, with my experience with Magis, I definitely think that Magis, or when I hear the word Magis, it reminds me of community, solidarity, understanding, and endless support, but it also kind of brings up some negative memories, being an other, an outcast, and a marginalized person. So, oh. There we go. One of the main ways in which the Magis Center tackles these community tensions and advances equity, inclusion, and racial justice is by promoting community-oriented beliefs or beliefs that connect the individual to the community. 45% of interviewees reported that the term Magis meant doing more or bettering oneself for the sake of oneself and one's community. And two-thirds of alumni embodied this call to in, in their own lives as they reported actively advocating for or being supportive allies of equity, inclusion, and racial justice issues in the future college communities and throughout 2020, crediting the Magis Center for providing a base of education, tools, and community support that really empowered them to do this. As one alumni puts it, the term Magis is just putting equity and inclusion into practice. Of course, now that I'm saying this, I'm realizing that you always talk about your Magis family, but 
It also extends past that, just learning how to be a better person for your community as well. Community being not just a Magis family, but also those around. So the term Magis and also the Magis Center in general, this kind of helps you be a better person to better execute that equity and inclusion outside of the center. While I'm still in the process of unearthing more research themes and their complexities, I'm honored to have had this challenge and opportunity through this cohort fellowship to bring my Georgetown education home and learn of the unique ways in which Jesuit educators and graduates in the US and around the globe are following in Father Rufe's words and bravely grappling with the most salient issues of our time. Thank you so much for listening. Hello, everyone. My name is Amber Stanford, um, and today I will be presenting on how the COVID-19 pandemic has impacted the university called Honoris and Lima, Peru. So a little bit about myself before I begin. Uh, I graduated this past May uh, from Georgetown and the college. Um, I majored in government theology um, while I was there. And I'm currently calling from uh, the University of Bristol in the United Kingdom as a Marshall Scholar. Um, in 2020, I was an education and social justice fellow, um, partnered with the University of Antonio Reese de Montoya as a research site. Um, and so, a bit about La Reese. Um, it's a nickname for University of Antonio Reese de, Mont de Montoya. Uh, it's a Jesuit university in Lima, Peru. Uh, and the community is made up of students, faculty, and staff from all over Peru. Uh, throughout the presentation, I have quotes from students and faculty uh, and staff uh, in the presentation as a way to provide space for their voices and for their own perspectives. Uh, and so one uh, philosophy professor I spoke to described his university as, our university is like a mirror from our society. And our goal is how we, how can we people from different backgrounds, practices, and beliefs live together in respect. Um, so I think that like a lot of these has its own mission statement, but I think that the philosophy professor really provided a great way of understanding their mission statement. Um, this map shows the hometowns of all the Peruvian participants that I had an opportunity to interview, uh, from the coastal city to Lima, uh, to Cusco and the Andes Mountains, um, to Quitos and the Amazon rainforest, to desert uh, towns in the Ica region, region sorry, in the South. Um, La Rosa's community members travel far and wide to reach the university. When Peru had its first uh, confirmed case of COVID-19 on March 6, many things changed for the country um, and for La Rosa's community specifically. Uh, on March 16th, the country went into lockdown, pushing many students from the provinces of Peru um, to decide whether they should stay in Lima, but live alone or return to their provinces um, and will live with their family, but have um, different situations than they would in Lima. Uh, in Peru, more than 70% of people work for cash in the informal sector. Uh, working in the informal sector provides limited job security and restricts their ability to work from home. As a result, in the summer of 2020, 31% uh, of Peruvians had lost their jobs since lockdown. Many students who return to their provinces face challenges in continuing their education due to limited access to healthcare, nutrition, and financial safety nets. In Peru, 44% uh, of households do not have a refrigerator, requiring family members to leave their homes during lockdown to shop at markets regularly. In addition, less than a third of Peruvian households have a computer, making it difficult for students without Wi-Fi or devices to participate in distant learning. These factors influence the conversations um, I was having with people in the university community, um, and this provides a bit of context before I like, enter into the research I did. So for my research, I conducted interviews on Zoom with 14 participants, five students, five alumni, uh, and four faculty and staff. These took place during the late summer of 2020, about August and September, uh, and conversations were held in both Spanish, English, and sometimes a mixture. Uh, La Larissa's Office of Institutional, Institutional Relations put me in contact with many members of the community, um, so I'm very thankful for their help, particularly Lauren, DeVoe, and Leslie. Um, and so through my research, uh, sorry, I think it skipped a slide, there it goes, okay. Uh, so my res research question I had uh, was, what measures has La uh, taken to combat social justice issues during the COVID-19 pandemic. 
And so the common things I found uh, were that educational continuity was prioritized in the university's financial decisions. That was my primary finding. Um, and then as part of this primary finding, I learned that um, educators, educators at Latter East were willing to reduce their wages in order to help the school stay afloat. The university also hired more people to provide additional support to students and the university's Jesuit identity influenced their priorities and sacrifice. On the topic of edu educational continuity, um, I learned so much from just talking to different community members um, and that in an interview, a journalism student said to me, honestly, many students are considering leaving a cycle or two due to financial difficulties. So the university is off offering scholarships for a few semesters or recategorization. It's a, it's a great benefit. I think it's correct. It has helped them in different ways. It's difficult to carry a distant learn education, but daily measures can be taken. It will be a good new semester this year I think the measures are correct. It's a great benefit in contrast to other universities in my, my, my country. This quote showed me that the university recognized some students would need to stop their programs due to financial costs, um, but they found a way to help students continue their learning despite the country's widespread financial crisis. Um, and the student indicated to me that like, this was specific to Valerie's and that this was not common among all the schools of Peru. Um, in another interview, a language professor shared, I think also that the decision to give students more time to pay off their student debt and also give them special scholarships to different students, I think that's helped us to maintain our numbers. And we actually have more students in language under this semester, even though we're still all virtual. And while the pay cut obviously also affected me, but not to the extent where it's put me in any extreme discomfort, it's basically like social responsibility. I think almost everyone who works at the university feels that and was willing to sacrifice so that we could keep it going. Uh, through my interviews with the language professor and other people at the university, I learned that there's a sense of social responsibility uh, within the community and that helping the university continue to function and continue its goals was a priority for many. Um, and then through interviews, I also like kind of heard this togetherness, um, the sense of togetherness that was mentioned um, as the professors and others kind of used the like, the pronoun we, and they were just describing themselves as a together unit instead of their own individual situations. Um, and so this next quote is from an interview uh, from an employee at the university's Office of Institutional Relations. Um, they said, why is the university employing more people during the pandemic? I think it's, be I think because the students need more help, more support. For example, with this pandemic, I think our students don't have money to pay for their studies. So we are searching for more opportunities like scholarships for them to continue their studies. Um, and so the, the person I was talking to uh, had been brought in to the university during the pandemic and hired during the pandemic um, as through the role they were like looking for scholarships to help their students and help other students attend their university. Um, so I was amazed by the university's like um, their ability to still hire people, but also their commitment to funding their students' education. Um, and so I really uh, thought it was interesting how the employee recognized the importance of their specific role uh, with the university and how it directly impacted students and their access to education. Um, and so my last example um, is from an interview with an employee in the university's Office of Quality uh, Assurance. They said, everybody's important. Everybody has something to give. Everybody has something to do, and we're not leaving anyone behind. I think it's a very strong message that I felt at La Reese, and the headmaster has had to make bigger sacrifices than assistance and other staff, but they do it with a full heart and display. In many interviews, um, community members spoke about their Jesuit training and how it's impacted their care for the community. Um, I think this quote really shows how much people care for each other and care for the university community. Um, and I think it's through this idea of care um, that the university that kind of starts from the top with their care, but also it, it flows throughout the university in the way they care for each other and care for each other's education. Um, and so on my conclusion slide, I kind of um, summarize all the points that I've made. Um, the university community prioritize, prioritize students and their ability to complete their studies uh, and their financial decisions. Uh, decisions included sacrifices by employees, and investing in um, their more support by hiring other people. Uh, 
And the decisions were also influenced by the Jesuit identity and the commitment to others. Um, and I think that while this is only one finding uh, that I've had while doing research, uh, I plan to continue looking more deeply and understanding the sense of care and the sense of commitment that the university community has to each other, especially during this crisis. Um, and I wanted to close off um, my presentation by reading one more quote by a journalism student uh, and how they kind of felt about their education at Lotteries. Um, they said, it is necessary that people work for society. I think it is one of the objectives, the motivation for lottery students. We study for this, for building a new society, for country in some way to change the situation. Um, I really enjoy just like learning so much about Lotteries and its students and its community. Um, they've been very inspiring, especially during this pandemic. Um, I started out with another project but had to quickly pivot when um, the pandemic first occurred. And so just understanding a bit what's happening in Peru and being able to have moments with uh, my, my interviewees where I, I understand them and they kind of understand me and how much this has been going on in both other countries but around the world has been a great experience, especially during such a dark time. And so I'm very thankful uh, for the fellowship and for both centers involved and everyone at Georgetown. And I'm very like thankful I was able to do this research. We're gonna open up the floor for questions. Are there any questions in the chat, Ruth? No, not yet, okay. Does anyone in the audience have a question for any of our presenters? I have a question for Tommy. Um, what, were there any guidelines in the school's handbook about community service where they're trying to basically incentivize or require students, maybe the fourth graders, uh, to, to start doing community service? Great question. Thank you, Henry. Um, so yes, but the, COVID, the pandemic kind of threw a wrench in a lot of community service plans because the, pro, the specific programs for the younger kids, just because they're so little, like fourth graders are a lot younger than you think they are. They don't have as much involvement in specific programs, but they will help out at um, local food pantries. There's a lot of different community centers and food pantries in the area that they will help out at. And they do like smaller stuff too, like raking leaves of people's yards in the neighborhood and stuff like that. But for more official involvement with community service, that would be the eighth graders. And they have um, specific programs and partnerships with, I'm, the, I'm blanking on the name, but a specific community center in Lawrence or Lowell, which are even more um, low income communities than the neighborhoods that these kids are coming from. And the partnerships facilitated through like um, the Jesuit Society of Jesus, and it's also a Jesuit school or Catholic school as well. Um, so yes, but COVID made it challenging, so they haven't been doing as much as they used to. I have a question for all three of you. So you all mentioned that when you looked at your communities, when you looked at the students, everybody was very much aware about the special time and what about the other way around? To which extent did others also know this? I'm not sure if I, so the question is, to what extent others were involved in community building during, or? To which extent others realize that there were all those efforts going on for community building, keeping the university open, yeah, making sure that there's some inclusion and equity happening. So all of those places have that additional social justice element and it's felt inside as well. Out. But to what, what extent do others also see that there is some sort of difference happening compared to other universities? Is that for everyone? Yeah. yeah. 
I can think of one specific example that I witnessed and I heard from staff and students. Um, so during the pandemic, at the beginning of it, they were all sent home and Nativity, they do have, they've been working on their technological involvement and providing the kids with iPads or laptops, Chromebook, I can't remember what they had. Chromebooks or an iPad or something. Um, but in addition to that, they also sent home gift bags with all the students for with different toiletries and stuff that their family was going to need. And it was just a really good thing that they need, like a way how the school adapted to this. And they realized, they recognized this need that students were being sent home and families have working parents and single parents who can't provide all of this during times when restricted to not even be going out or whatnot. So I thought that was one specific example. If I, if I interpreted the question correctly, if not, I could hear their answers and then see if I can come back to it. Okay, Abby or Gamp, or <laughs> Gabby or Amber, did either one of you want to, oh, you weren't actually able to hear the question? Okay. Yeah, so the question was, um, you know, in each of your sites, the, the community themselves understood that they were doing social justice work, but how much was the, the community outside of La Ruiz or Majas, were they aware of the work that was being done? I think I can speak to that. Um, so that was actually something that was reiterated throughout my research themes, um, was the lack of awareness about what Majas was doing, its programming, um, the space itself. There was not a lot of um, knowledge from the outside greater community about Majas. Um, and with that, there was a desire expressed by faculty members to connect more and to perhaps do more outreach to connect with um, outside members or members who wouldn't have been introduced in the first place um, because they wouldn't fit the modest profile. Um, and that was actually, yes, like a, a theme that was very prominent, just the lack of knowledge and lack of awareness. I can also speak to your question marks. Um, I, for my interviews uh, with professors and students, a lot of people said that they felt that transparency um, and trust was really important in Peruvian society. Um, and so people would speak about their families recognizing the Jesuits reputation and feeling that they were safe and feeling that their education was really meaningful. Um, and so I would ask uh, people in interviews like, oh, is this similar to your sister's school college or university? Or is this similar to your friend's university? They're like, no, this is like my university only. Um, and so I think that people who are aware of the university's reputation or their Jesuit influence uh, were somehow like aware of its, its, um, its like work in social justice. Um, I'm not sure if it's their outreach or it's just like what they're known for, but people were aware that the university was doing something really good there. Um, but I also know that the Office of Institutional Relations didn't only reach out to other universities. Uh, they were also working with high school students. Um, I think it's in the Fe and Alegria, y Alegria uh, university, uh, high schools uh, in Peru and they would work and do outreach there. And so um, their work or their influence wasn't only with other universities, uh, and their friends and family, but also with high school students who are looking to attend university. So I have a question for each of you to address individually. You've each worked with a different age group, and I'm curious as to what is distinct about being a part of that age group during COVID within your specific context. So for example, what's distinct about being um, in fourth through eighth grade at Nativity Prep during a time of COVID rather than another age group at that time for each of your respective um, site placements. I could start if I'm, since I'm the youngest. <laughs> so thank you, Kat, great question. Um, so working with students as young as the ages of like, I'm trying to think of how old we are in the fourth grade, eight, nine, yeah. yeah. Um, so at that age, it has definitely been very challenging for them, it seems. And so how the school was working, they have a rotating schedule where there was a, red, a maroon pod and a gold pod. And so each pod would come on, come back to school in different days. But there's also students who were, would choose to be virtual for the entire year. So for some of these fourth graders, 
they were bringing them in at the end of the year, actually, while I was there. And it had been their first time in the building in the two years they had been there. And it's one thing, like, I feel like for college students, like, we're like, oh, our sophomores and freshmen at Georgetown, like, they've never actually been on campus. It's like, we're old enough to kind of understand that the kids, they haven't even seen their classrooms, their classmates. So I thought it was pretty jarring for them. Um, in addition to that, they haven't been able to offer the after school programs, which are completely staffed by a lot of volunteer families and um, board members. So that's also been a huge, not loss, but something to deal with and a challenge that a wrench has been thrown in like such a crucial part of the nativity model. Gabby, do you want to go next? I'm just uh, formulating a uh, response. Um, I believe what was significant about being a part of the age group that I was interviewing, um, I think was definitely, um, this also ties back to my connection with my research site um, as I was a graduate um, of the, the class of 2017 and my age group who I was interviewing um, with alumni were um, graduates of the classes of 2017 when the Modges um, office merged with the Office of Equity and Inclusion down to 2020. Um, and so it was impactful in that I had actually witnessed myself as a student um, all of the different changes that had um, happened um, in regards to the space and Modges and um, returning back as a researcher, um, it was very interesting to see as an alumni, um, just seeing how like the differences in responses um, between people from um, my grade versus um, what happened um, in the following years of alumni that I, that I interviewed. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, I think that I think that my connection, along with being my age, being in college and being apart from the space and learning all, all the, the changes and um, experiences that were being had after I left, um, that was very, I think, eye-opening to see and to come back, not as a student anymore, but um, with my researcher hat on. I really enjoyed the question. I think it makes me reflect on my experience interviewing other college students um, at the time. And so I think that one way that a lot of recent universities in Peru are different from American universities um, is that most university students don't live together with other university students. So they don't live in like a dorm or a residence hall. Uh, they live and rent like their own apartments and get their own housing uh, that's nearby the university. Um, and so I think that one way COVID really impacted their, their studies and their, their living is that they had to decide between, or many students who were from outside of Lima had to decide between living in Lima alone without a physical community or going back home. Uh, and so students who traveled six to 10 hours from their home province to Lima, Lima were living alone, had to figure out how to do all these things uh, like figuring out food or figuring out uh, just like how to spend your time uh, on their own. And I think that made it very difficult for new students and for students who just didn't really have a physical community that, that would be typical of their, their university experience. Um, and so I think that it was a really interesting experience like talking to other college students while I was still at Georgetown because I understood some of the loneliness I felt and some of the experiences that they, we're having because it was such a new situation for all of us. 